Over these last three weeks, I have certainly, I don't know if enjoy is the word, but I, I've grown through preparing and delivering these sermons to you under the, the theme of finding common ground. As I've said repeatedly, this is a year, it seems like, with the elections and so forth, especially that everybody delights in fragmented, uh, fragmenting and polarizing. Have you seen the latest presidential debates? I thought I was on a school playground hearing arguments among the kids. So it is very timely. How can we stop that and join our humanity together as one? So that's what we've been working on. If you have missed any of those sermons, please be sure to catch them online. Tomorrow's e-blast that I'm going to send out will have a link to each one. You might use that as a convenient way to catch up because they do form, I believe, a very important message for us individually and as a church. Today, we're going to continue hearing what Moses had to say. We started last week with how Moses told us very easily, very quickly, very simply, love the immigrant, the alien in your midst. Now, in the 16th chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses is describing something else. He will be describing three key festivals of the Jewish year. As the wandering children of Israel would be crossing the Jordan soon to be an established nation in the promised land, he is saying that there are festivals that they must, uh, they must observe in order to uh, worship God, to come together, and to seek God's direction. So, one festival is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it is in, in uh, concert with the act of the Passover, and we Christians have taken that over in terms of the Lord's Supper, Maundy Thursday. The second festival that Moses describes in the 16th chapter is the festival of weeks, as in my last name. A delightful title for a festival. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. And we have taken that over in the Christian church in the season and the celebration of Pentecost. But what we're going to focus on today are the words of institution for the Festival of Booths, or Tabernacles, also known as the Festival of Sukkot. Let me give you a little bit of background to this. Actually, I should say I got the background to this. I checked out what I was going to say with our uh, rabbi just up the street, Rabbi Brigitte Rosenberg, who... uh, gave me a lot of good sources about uh, this very special festival. Uh, And uh, Rabbi, if you happen to be watching a video, I want to apologize for any Protestant misinterpretations I'm about to do. So please be be lenient on me. But she was a, a great resource. And she suggested that we hear the Jewish translation from the Hebrew of what Moses said in instituting Sukkot. So, from the Jewish Publication Society, please hear now the words of Moses. This scripture passage is from, the, is from Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. Thou shalt keep the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, after thou hast gathered from thy threshing floor from thy winepress, and thou shalt rejoin in thy feast, thou and thy son and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, and that are within thy gates. Seven days shall you keep the feast unto the Lord thy God in the place with which the Lord shall choose, because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in thine increase, and in all the work of thy hands thou shalt be altogether joyful." Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, on the feast of unleavened bread, and on the feast of weeks, and on the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. 
Lord God, as you've moved in many gracious ways in this service, would you please move a portion of your spirit into the words about to be spoken and heard, into that which will be thought and felt, so that in all ways we honor the living Christ in our midst. Amen. I want to suggest to you that the Feast of Sukkot is actually a metaphor, if you will, of what the church must be about today. Sure, about 3,000 years have passed since it was instituted, but the message of Sukkot, more specifically the four imperatives or commands of Sukkot that God makes in that feast, very relevant for us today. So that's simply what my sermon is, four points. Here's the first command. You celebrate unity, Hebrew people, Manchester United Methodist people. Rejoice during your festival, you and your sons and your daughters and your male and female slaves, as well as the Levites, the strangers, the orphans, and the widows resident in your towns. Now note, to begin this festival, who do you invite? Everybody. You don't just invite your close friends and your family. No, you invite, and they specified this, those who are on the periphery of society, those who receive resources from society and not give back to society, the slaves, the widows, the orphans, and the immigrants. It's interesting that there's also that phrase, the Levites, because the Levites were the name, uh, the Levites, that's the name of the priests, the preachers, if you will, of Jewish society, the professional religious people, the ones who would hang around all day in church and prepare sermons and prayers and, and rituals, you know, the useless ones. They bunch them right in because you cannot contribute to society, so they're all together in there. And what do we do with this motley crew, the ones who are the haves and the have-nots of society? Well, they all come together and they build a set of these, the sukkahs or the booths, the tabernacles, the temporary shelters that could easily be erected and then torn down. But for seven days, this assembly of the people were united in living under these booths, tabernacles. That meant that around the dinner tables, the slaves and the slave owners would pass the, the unleavened bread. That meant that around the dinner table, you would have the orphans and the widows sitting down with the wealthy business people. That meant that you would have the teenagers sitting down with the aliens exchanging stories. Do you see how radical that is? all on the same playing field, none living in a 6,500-square-foot house or none living on the street corner, but all together. And is that not what the, Jesus envisioned for, for the church in general, for our church, under this beautiful uh, sukkah, this beautiful tabernacle booth, if you will, that in this place, we are all equal and of equal worth, regardless of our political affiliation, regardless of our gender, regardless of our sexual orientation, regardless of our, uh, our social status, regardless of whether we have a PhD, a JD, an MD, or a GED, regardless at all of our ethnicity, all come together equally around the Lord's table. The Bible says that we all came from a common ancestor. Science says we all came through millions of years of evolution, ultimately from one common ancestor. And the Feast of Sukkah is nothing more than an affirmation of our common ancestry getting away from all human distinctions. Thus, was the Jewish nation to be, thus is the Christian church to be. Celebrate unity. And the second command that God gives through Moses about Sukkot is this, celebrate abundance. 
once you have collected the food and drink you need, perform the festival. Once you collect the food and drink you need. Isn't that interesting? Don't start the festival until you've gathered all the chicken wings, the deep dish pizza, none of this thin crust stuff. That's, that was in a paraphrased version of the Bible. The roasted beef, the broiled fish, uh, you just keep on it. Once you've got all of the, the stuff that you would see in the hibachi grill buffet, once you've assembled all of this and all the drinks of your choice, then you come and you start to perform it. Enough for seven days. And do you think that they all just sat around the table looking glum? Like I did at seminary trying to learn Hebrew? No. They partied. They, they had the ancient equivalent of the Manchester Brass. They danced and they sang and they had a great time all together. And sometimes I think the church discounts the importance of having fun. I think this church does a great job of faith formation, small group work. This, job, this church does a great job of mission work, of offering seven worship opportunities for you. The list could go on. We need to be just as intentional about enabling you to have fun. We have a trivia night coming up, March the 11th. If you haven't bought your tickets yet at the table in the back, in the words of Jesus, shame on you. I think the next day there's an extravaganza that we have for kids and families and the community as well. I hear, can you keep a secret? I hear that the United Methodist men are going to sponsor a tremendous, never done before, all-day Pentecost celebration, May 15th. Do I get an amen? amen? I expect Kevin Tobin, head of Methodist Men, to really say an amen. amen. That was very good. <laughs> and apple butter's coming back. And, let's see, fall festival is coming back. We can keep multiplying those opportunities. We have a golf team. We have a softball team. Both. You get the idea. Because when you're playing together, you don't see a Republican or a Democrat. What you see is a teammate or someone simply to enjoy. I was just hearing on the radio today uh, from the, the Moran Tabernacle Choir, of all things, you talk about a Holy Spirit incident, they were talking about eating. And, and this Mormon Tabernacle Choir, the commentator, and he was saying, when you sit down, invite someone over to eat because when you sit down, all the differences go away because we're all united by our one common need for food. And the commentator went on to say, this is where we find common ground. And I was so upset that he took the title of my series. <laughs> but it's it. Have fun together. Third imperative, celebrate God's guidance. You will note that it does not say you will celebrate Sukkot on Mount Sinai or at Shechem or Gilead. You will celebrate where God will show you to celebrate. And the, the Hebrews hearing that would have remembered the call to Abraham. Abraham, go to a land I will show you. The call to Moses, Tell Pharaoh, let my people go, and I will take them to a land that I will show them. Now, they are to have the symbol of unity and of God's faithfulness at a certain place at a certain time, at God's choosing. Look at our church. Dating back prior even to 1856, we were called to celebrate Sukkot after the Civil War to help heal the bloody wounds of our nation. We were called to, as a congregation, celebrate Sukkot in the aftermath of the, the wars from the last century. We were called to celebrate Sukkot in the midst of the, the protests and the turmoil and sometimes the riots that stemmed in the last half of the last century and the opening years of this century. 
we are called by God to celebrate at this time in the midst of all the polarization and the fear of the unknown, to celebrate God's faithfulness and God's guidance even now. Where everyone else is wringing their hands from the top down saying, what's going to happen if he or she is elected? We know that regardless of the election, we are called to celebrate Sukkot, our unity that can never be compromised by whatever happens beyond the walls of this church, beyond the walls of this Sukkah. Finally, fourth command is, part of Sukkah is celebrate sacrifice. Each one should have in his, his gift in hand in precise measure with the blessing that the Lord gives you. Isn't it interesting that he notes, in precise measure, everyone from the orphan, the, the widow, the slave, they bring a gift of food or drink to the festival, just as the person, just as a Stan Kroenke of that era would give food and drink accordingly. It is a sign that the person believes in the importance of thanking God. It is a sign that the person believes in sharing food and drink and strengthening the unity of a diverse body. That's the essence of it. That is the essence of the Christian church. Are you able to sacrifice and commit, not equal gifts, equal sacrifice, in order for the church that you're in, in order for Manchester United Methodist Church to fulfill its mission of being the symbol of unity? Can you do that? Are you willing to do that? If a church has more takers than givers, that church will never achieve its mission. But if the church has folks more concerned with, with how can I be part of what God is doing, that is when that church can certainly celebrate the festival of Sukkot. What are you willing to sacrifice to provide food and drink for your brothers and sisters here? Is it your money, proportional giving? Is it your time in prayer and service and worship? Is it a personal commitment that you will catch yourself from now on making any, any fast, quick judgment about someone different from yourself that might be the best gift of all? Because as you do that on a daily basis, my, how that pays dividends when we all together are here to celebrate. What you give reflects just how important it is to join Moses' God's imperatives to be the church we're called to be. And to be the church we're called to be, each member takes the vow to do these four things, to celebrate our unity together, to celebrate the abundance of our fellowship, to always listen to how we can be a witness to God's faithfulness, and to give, not take, give more to be able to provide food and drink. And that's it. Now, I said early on that in Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, we have those two other Jewish festivals and their Christian equivalents to those. The, the, the festival of Sukkot sort of hangs out there. What could possibly be the Christian equivalent of that? Well, when you read some of Jesus' teachings, you get the idea. It might not be the Jewish Sukkot Jesus had in mind, but he also had in mind, or rather he had in mind what's called the, the, the Messiah's banquet table. That time sometime in the future where Sukkot, the unity, would be celebrated not seven days a week, but throughout eternity. Listen to what Jesus said when he was invited uh, to, to be at a person's house, rich man's house, he said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may, may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, the orphans, the strangers, 
we can go on and on. The, the preachers, you can go on and on. Go and invite them, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You will be repaid at my banquet table, says the Messiah. But we have an investment to make in Jesus' Sukkot. We have invitations to send out. You'll remember that I started this sermon three weeks ago by breaking a lot of colored tile here. And after several services, there was nothing left but fragments in a plastic case. Good for nothing. But for those of you who celebrate the spirit of that Jewish festival, for those of you who pray every day for the Messiah's banquet to come to pass, you know that Jesus can never leave brokenness alone. You know that through his love as embodied in the cross, he brought all that brokenness, all the ugliness of the fragments, he brought together to make something beautiful. Jesus committed his life to bring people together under the lordship of his love. So may we.